We continue our series of conversations with all of the 17 candidates on the ballot for Denver mayor with community organizer and civil rights activist Terrence Roberts. Welcome to Next. Thanks hey, for coming in. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. You have brought attention to the issue of poverty as the common thread in a lot of Denver's problems. You're talking about poverty in a way that we are not hearing the other candidates talk about poverty. What do you think they're missing on this? Well, I think that um, a lot of our candidates are more focused on talking points for to just make people feel like they're the best candidate versus really getting to the key issues of why people can't afford um, affordable housing, why people can't afford Excel energy bills right now, because they're poor. And, and that's the key issue with all of this is our housing cost, the key reasons for their, why there's violence is because of the poverty that's, uh, that's happening. So um, I'm less talking points, more just getting to what's the root cause and what's the solution. It's interesting. Uh, you're the 17th mayoral candidate I've interviewed. You're the first to use the word poor. Yeah. What do you what do you think that's about? We talk about the issues, but you're the one who's stressing that poverty is at the root of so many of these different issues. Why do you think that that's being avoided so much? Um, you know, I think people are very nervous. I notice some of the candidates are nervous to talk about these things because you don't think of Denver as a city that is a poor city. You think of places like Philadelphia. You think of places like South Central, Los Angeles, or Watts, or Compton. No, there's poverty here in Denver, and it's okay to say these things, especially if you want to be the, the, the CEO of the city. It's okay to be honest about what's affecting our constituency, or how can you address an issue that you're afraid to talk about because you, you're afraid to lose votes? It's okay to talk about the root causes of these issues. I'm not afraid to have that conversation. There are poor people in Denver. There's poverty in, in historical communities in Denver that are getting bowled over by development. That's the key issue of this election. Everyone's talking about different forms of development, public housing, affordable housing, Prop 123. But the reason why all of those conversations are being had, because there's poor people in the city of Denver. What solutions do you think are most promising to lift people out of poverty, put them on a better path? I mean, I think most people are spending their money on what? On housing costs, food costs, um, fuel. When I say fuel, I mean staying warm in the house. That's, that's gas. And also gas in your car, getting your kids to school, driving around town. Um, so if, if most of your income is, coming, is going to housing, then yes, we do need, when Governor Polis signs rent control into law at a state level, at a, mu at a municipal level, we do need to sign into law. And you know my campaign um, is based on more public social housing and a public banking system to pay for it. Prop 123 is great. I heard Mike Johnson on your show talking about it. That's money that eventually, when it does go for affordable housing, that money is going to developers still. I'm saying in order for someone to get to affordable housing, they, there's steps to get there, Kyle. No one is moving from chronic homelessness from a tent off of Colfax and Broadway into affordable housing. They, if someone needs counseling for fentanyl abuse, cocaine abuse, alcoholism, sexual abuse as a child, if they can't get a good night's sleep, you wasted a counseling session. You, you, people need to be able to feel safe, have a home. We already have public housing in Denver. And public housing is in pretty much every municipality, which is, I'm saying we need more of it. Then someone can move to attainable low-income housing, then they can move into affordable housing. That's why solutions like Proposition 123, we, we had a candidate in here talking about Prop 123, but then they're talking about putting people in the tough sheds and ending homelessness in their first, in, in, in their, in their first term. It's like, no. It, you can't do a Prop 123, didn't talk about putting people in tough sheds. Homeless people don't want to live in tough sheds. We can't retrofit or build more public housing in Denver if that's what the mayor's um, putting his mind to or her mind to, whoever wins. So let's take a couple of those issues one by one. Rent control. Yeah. Um, so you said when Governor Polis signs rent control. I don't know that Governor Polis is going to sign rent control, but that's out of your hands or mine. It, it, it is. Yeah. I think he will, but if he does not, then we'll figure it out. If he signs it then municipalities have the ability to opt in. You heard folks like Chris Hansen just laugh off this idea and just say, doesn't work, never work, <clears throat> we shouldn't try it. Why do you feel differently? I'm, I mean, because for one, landlords are going to be okay. I'm, uh, I'm not saying if someone breaks into your house and they're there for 48 hours, they own your home. No, that's not what rent control is. It's just that you just can't every single year keep raising rates unnecessarily. 
Uh, landlords will be fine if you, if you can own a home and make extra money, even if you don't all all the way own a home, and if, even if you're paying a mortgage on a home and you're still leasing it for more to somebody else, you're still going to make extra income. You just can't gouge people who are already um, on a low income basis. You don't think that that's going to cause landlords to walk away? I don't think it's going to cause landlords to walk away. People always use certain examples like, oh, it failed in New York City, says who? Denver, Colorado was not the Bronx. I don't know if you've been to the Bronx lately. These are two totally <laughs> different places. I do think rent control will work. It's worked in other municipalities. Um, some municipalities, it may not have worked so great, but in Denver, we are going to try it. Um, and if it doesn't work, then we'll see. I'm also going to be the type of mayor to where I'm not a, a bullheaded person. If something is not working, then we'll look at it and we'll change course. But right now, when I'm elected mayor, we are going to institute rent controls at a municipal level if it's signed into state law, yes, sir. A public bank, very few communities in the U.S. have tried to set up a public bank. I think this would be the third by, by your count. Tell folks about that concept as you see it working in Denver. Um, so, I mean, a public banking system is just like how a credit union runs. North Dakota is operating off of a public banking system. There are other municip municipalities in the United States and globally um, that are running Germany, for, for instance. Um, I'm saying that we need to add a public banking system that will add initially tens of millions, uh, if not more. Uh, I don't want to say hundreds of millions. That could be really inflating how much money could come in. But there's the potential, depending on how many people use our public banking system. We have to get outside of our general fund to be able to retrofit or build more public housing. We have to go outside of just what Dura is doing. We need to bring more income sources to our city, like making Denver a 24-hour city, to do the things that we're all saying we're doing. We can't just depend on Prop 123. That's still going to affordable housing. And I'm not against affordable housing. I'm more worried about making sure that the 8,000 people that are chronically homeless, they can move into a place to get counseling, then get themselves ready for affordable housing, and they, we need to democratize our banking. No one who is chronically homeless is walking into an affordable housing complex with 5,500 in cash and slapping down a big wad of cash, saying, here's 5,500, let me get an affordable housing unit. No, we need to add um, um, banking services to our unhoused as well, and it will add extra income for our infrastructure. So you also talk about the idea of, of social housing, where the city would get into developing properties as opposed to having a for-profit developer uh, do that. You've said that corporate greed has driven Denver into a housing crisis. It seems like the corporations you're describing as greedy, some of the other candidates will describe as valuable partners in building housing. Do you want to work with developers? You want developers to get lost? You just want them to leave this segment of housing alone? What's your view toward developers? So I'm not against anyone, okay? This is my thing. This administration has been in power for 12 years. I'm not here to rag on. We're moving past this. However, developers have had a field day in the city of Denver. I'm not against development. They're cramming through. I think we're like 38 projects just for downtown alone. If you see our permitting um, that has been passed for, for new builds, it, it, it's skyrocketed. So developers will be fine. If you can spend $24 million on a pot of land that already has an easement on it, uh, wink, wink to West Side Investment, <laughs> if you can spend that, I'm, I'm pretty sure you'll be fine with Terrence Roberts being the mayor. Uh, we still have affordable housing going up. We still have Prop 123. They're not going to stop building affordable housing. I'm saying we need to focus more on public social housing, which will still have to be built by them. They just won't be owned by them. It will be owned by the constituency of Denver. Developers will be fine if Terrence Roberts is the mayor of Denver. They just won't be the main focus. And if, if they've already chosen their candidates, I never thought I would be the developer's candidate, nor do I care about that. I'm not for developers or against developers. I'm for the people of Denver. Uh, so I take, it you, I take it you're a no on the Park Hill golf course redevelopment as it stands now. I am a definite no. What should happen with that property, though? Um, do I think it should just be a golf course? No, but it, it, that's deceptive languaging that is being used to say it's just going to be a dried up golf course. That's not true. There's different things. We can turn it into a field that could be used by sports for, for children, soccer fields, football fields. We could put water fountains there. We could put huge family areas. That, that we could put the biggest playground in the world there. Uh, Do you want housing there? I, that's what I don't want there is housing. You don't want housing on there? No, that I thing. do not want housing there. 
No. Not, so folks will say this is a once in a lifetime opportunity I'm not a to, put in, to put in housing. Okay. <laughs> People say it's a once in a lifetime opportunity to put in housing. Denver's not going to find space like this in the future. Of course, open space advocates also say once in a lifetime opportunity for the yeah. open space. Yeah. But if, if you want housing and you want affordable housing, why not some of it there? Because it's affordable for who? I don't know if you've been listening to me uh, at these debates. That's our term. Affordable housing is affordable for who? Who decides what's affordable? So Westside Investment comes in, they buy this property, they put up hundreds of affordable housing units, but a small percentage is for really only for affordable housing, and the rest is, is at scale or whatever they want it to be at. How's that going to help the African-American community that's being gentrified out of First, it was they, people were gentrified out of the five points, pushed east into Northeast Park Hill, Mabello, GVR. Now, the, the, the last one third of the African Americans are going to be pushed out of, uh, out of Northeast Park Hill. Uh, I'm worried about gentrification. I'm not just saying this because I'm a black man. If I was a white man, I would be. I'm worried about neighborhoods like Northeast Park Hill, neighborhoods like Glowville, Lyria, Swansea. It is big box development that is pushing us out. And most of our development is circled around a conversation of affordable housing that people cannot afford. It, I think it's just a buzzword to keep developers busy. And if developers don't like me saying that, that that's fine. I'm, I'm saying what I'm supposed to be saying to anyone running for mayor. I'm not here for billionaire developers to develop structures that are not needed. Do we need more housing? Yes, we need more public housing. Now, there are affordable housing projects like the Fresh Low Project that's going on in Montbello. I support that because I'm not against affordable housing, but if we can do things outside of just the traditional, only developers are saying we're bringing affordable housing, but really we're making a billion dollars in the next few years off of this, I support that. However, I don't think housing in that particular part of Northeast Park Hill is going to help that community any, and it's not going to solve our homelessness issues. It's just going to make Westside developers rich, and they're already rich enough. About homelessness, you oppose the Hancock administration's current homeless sweeps. You've said that you will not forcibly clear homeless encampments. You will not arrest people simply for refusing shelter or treatment and violating the, the homeless camping ban. How would you then get people into shelter and off the streets? So if you... There is an old term, if you built it, they will come. Because, you know, I, I hear candidates coming on your show ragging on shelter space or promoting shelter space in a way that they shouldn't be because most homeless people do not want to go to shelter spaces. I, 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 I know what homeless people are saying. I, I'm an advocate. Uh, if we have more housing that is truly attainable, then not only can we shuffle people who need housing, uh, uh, not against their will, they'll go to housing on their own because they want to go to housing. They've expressed this. And for those who are saying, you know what, Terrence, I don't care what you do. I don't want to live in a structure. I don't want to go. We need, we need more shelter space. Our shelters and our housing units are failing. They're not failing. They're struggling, I will say. They're not failing because they're overwhelmed. There's 8,000 homeless people sleeping on our streets at night. We need more shelter space. We need more safe encampment space. And when I say camp, safe encampments, it's okay for us to provide hot showers for our unhoused neighbors. It's okay to give them tube socks, menstrual products, hygiene products. It's okay to have, if you can have a screen like that in Nine News, it's okay for us to put a $200 TV screen up and put it in a place to where people feel safe. There's more lighting, there's counseling services, there's hygiene products. You could take a shower, you could wash your clothes. There's a trash receptacle there, so they're not on the news getting eaten by rats. So we can do more for people who don't want to live in structures and for people who want to live in housing. We need more public social housing. You're talking about 8,000 unsheltered homeless. That's 4x the number that I hear from other candidates. No, there are eight. See, people are talking about just chronically homeless. Just because you're not sleeping in a tent on Colfax and Broadway or on 13th and Grant, that doesn't mean that you're not homeless. You're talking about sheltered and unsheltered homeless. So yeah. people who are sleeping in cars, crashing at their friend's house, That's that homeless. kind of thing. That's, I, I understand. I understand. Yeah. Okay. So when you said 8,000, you mean sheltered and unsheltered? Yes, sir. Homeless. Okay. All right. Very good. Uh, one of the key issues in the race is crime and public safety. And you've said that Denver should reimagine the purpose of policing to focus on public safety instead of protecting private luxury. Can you give me some examples of how Denver is focused on, per on protecting private luxury? Um, uh, uh, a good example is the urban camping ban. <laughs> That's the perfect example. Um, we're just shuffling homeless people around because they're poor. They have nowhere to go. They're not getting counseling services properly because they have nowhere to sleep to let that counseling really absorb into their mind, into their psyche. Um, they're having to survive. This is a cold weather city and we're using our police force not to solve crimes, not to 
not to keep areas safe. We're using a, a large bulk of our police inventory and um, power to just push homeless people around shuffling from one place to another. So that's the perfect example of us using our police force to protect luxury versus our people is just using no, I don't think there's anybody who became a police officer who in high school said, you know what, I wanna become a police officer to wake up at four o'clock in the morning to go push homeless people from one place to another. It's a waste of our resources, it's a waste of our, um, our public tax dollars, and it's not solving the issue, the issue is only getting worse. In recent years, you've gotten really involved in police reform activism. Mm -hmm. What's your assessment of DPD as an agency? I think DPD for too long has really tried to act too much like Los Angeles PD. What way? Well, just even a, a lot of our, our issues in Denver with crime is youth violence. Violence in Denver is different from violence in Detroit. Violence in Detroit is different from violence in Philadelphia. You know, violence is violence, but there are different precursors and causes. A lot of our violence in Denver, a lot of our shootings, last year we had 88 homicides, which was a decrease, but a lot of those homicides got pushed to Aurora because where are people being displaced to? far northeast Denver and then pushed into east into Aurora. Um, so even though we've seen a decrease of 12 homicides, you know, but still, it, it, it's still happening in Denver and it's youth related. So that should be our focus is really decreasing the reasons why people want to commit crimes versus just focusing on those outside issues. How would DPD change under your leadership? Well, I mean, it's DPDs, uh, so if you know, I'm not yelling, defund the police, because I think that's more of a slogan than what's realistic. We just we need to make sure that DPD, and I'm seeing more of a focus on community-based relations, but uh, you know, this whole emphasis on just pushing homeless people around, uh, uh, we're still gonna have the police. We will do a public safety audit so I can see where money is lacking or, 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 or and in excess, if DP is, DPD is hoarding money that they don't need, yeah, we have a, a rising crime rate, then we will shift that around to community-based organizations. But I, I do have more of a focus on preventing crime versus punishing crime after someone's been robbed, after someone. Now, if you rob someone or you kill someone, then guess what, you're, you're gonna go to jail. So I'm not against the police either. I'm not against developers, I'm not against the police. I just think that if Denver had more of a community focus around these issues to prevent crime, prevent children from joining gangs versus just let them join the gang and then arrest them later, I think we will save a lot of our time and our money um, and this will be a much safer city. So the DPD won't change much under my leadership other than just being more community focused versus catch them after they hurt someone focus. So you talk openly about your past growing up, you got involved in gangs, mm -hmm. served time, you turned to the community, worked as an anti-violence activist. In that work, you worked directly with some of the people that you're running against for mayor now. Mm -hmm. How does your life experience inform how you would lead the city as mayor, whether it relates, whether it relates to criminal justice or otherwise? Um, I mean, so I started my 501c3 in my basement. I've been able to have over $10 million in community developments that were spearheaded by me and my, my constituencies, not just myself, but I was a part of those conversations in the Holly, um, lowering crime. We lowered crime in this city for several years. You know, uh, domestic violence homicides, gang-related homicides, and, and it's a, these are provable numbers, too. These aren't just me just making claims. That these, these are provable numbers. Uh, I have been in a, in a negative peer group as a kid. I was in a the gang. There, there's negative peer groups from football teams. You could, be, you could be a part of a fraternity or sorority and be part of a negative peer group, my negative peer group was me being uh, a gang member, and I went through that, and then I left the gang. It's been over 20 years, people always bring it up. I've been out of that gang for almost three decades now, uh, but I do have to live experience of working with traumatized youth, um, getting them involved with jobs, with extracurricular activities, a quality nationally awarded after school program. Um, I know how to lower violence by engaging people who are doing the crimes, because not only have I been a part of it, but they respect me. And, just like hardworking people who are housed and who do have a job need outlets like go going to a brewery, uh, having fun at a Rockies game, a, a Nuggets game. So do people who have been involved with youth trauma, youth violence, domestic violence. We don't have dedicated youth spaces. I don't hear any candidate talking about our youth. How many women were murdered in the metro area last year and continuing this year? Young women being murdered on the five points, young women being uh, Jasmine Hernandez, her body was found on Colfax in Quebec. N not one candidate has mentioned this young woman's name. It's like no one cares about youth violence and that is something that it, people are worried about in Denver. It's actually the second thing people are worried about, but I'm not hearing candidates say words like poor. 
I'm not hearing candidates say things like gang and, and, and youth violence and violence against women. I know people feel like, oh, just, you know, it's just time for a woman to be the mayor just because it's been a bunch of men. No, it's time for the best person with the best plan to be the mayor, whether they're a woman, a man, LGBTQIA, heterosexual, whatever. Um, and that's my lived experience is working with the community uh, and getting things done, results that we can prove that have drastically made this um, lowered homicides and made our city a safer place. Do you think Denver's ready to elect somebody who has a criminal record? Um, I think Denver is listening to me, and I think Denver is ready to elect who's going to take our city into the future properly. Because I have to say this, Kyle, whoever's our next mayor, they can be mayor for 12 years. I'm also saying we only need two-term mayors. We need to change our city charter. That is a lot of consolidated power. If Governor Polis can only do two terms and people are saying the mayor of Denver is the most powerful political seat in the state of Colorado, then why shouldn't the mayor's office be limited to two terms? That is a lot of consolidated power. The, the appointments the mayor makes, we need to add more democracy to our city. I'm saying these things. I don't think people care as much about my criminal history as what I've done since then and what I'm planning to do in the future. And people are listening that my platform is solid, so much so we have progressive candidates who are openly saying, you know what, we're just going to use Terrence's platform, but vote for me. That was actually my last question. I've gotten the sense that you think that there are candidates in the race who are taking credit for ideas that were yours. Yes. I you want to name names and programs? I mean, here we are. So it had, did I invent public housing? Of course I did not invent public housing. But you sat right in front of us at the last debate, and you heard Leslie Harrod, and I like Leslie, man. I, I, I like Lisa, so you're asking for names. However, I've never heard Leslie in her entire career say, we need more social housing. Thanks, Leslie, because if I don't win this election, part of our plan for Terrence Roberts running, if I can't beat powerful politicians, big corporate-backed politicians, you're gonna, you, you need to hear that we need more public and social housing. And if, if Leslie wins, great, I'm glad I heard you say it on the Nine News stage. First time in politics she said it. Um, I do think Ms. Calderon, she literally came in third last time. If you go look at any debate Ms. Calderon has ever done running for mayor previously and after I announced my candidacy, I've never heard Ms. Calderon say we need more public social housing. So, do I just own that term? Is it just me, me, me? No. But if one of these two ladies get into office, we definitely need that, that to happen. But instead of people voting for someone else to do my platform, you might as well just vote for me to do my own platform. <laughs> how, how, about, how about the police reform bill of 2020? Um, how about it? I drafted it, actually. You're looking at me like... No, I, I've heard you things? say it before. That's why I asked you about <laughs> it. I mean, Leslie Heron's running. She's running on that bill. She is running on that she bill. She got it passed. She did get it passed. And thank you, Ms. Um, Herod for doing that because we needed her and that's the power of having people in position who are state lawmakers and community working together but let's let the truth come out about Senate Bill 217. We drafted the first draft of Senate Bill 217 in my apartment, in my living room, at my kitchen table and in, in November of 2019 we took this first draft to Mrs. Herod. Um, Chantel Lewis was sitting in the room and so was James Coleman and Mrs. Harris pretty much looked me in the eye and said, this will never pass. I have family members that are law enforcement. Um, no one will vote for this, not even progressive Democrats. It, it, really, this is not a great idea. It was called the Elijah McClain Police Accountability Bill. Months after this, George Floyd was murdered, had a knee on his neck for nine minutes. You interviewed me during that time. We were, we were organizing. We had 10,000 people downtown. We shifted that focus from George Floyd locally to more Elijah McClain justice. Um, then she decided to run, which is now called Senate Bill 217. And also there's a House Bill 1250 that no one mentions, but House Bill 1250 also goes with Senate Bill 217. But after George Floyd was murdered, yes, yeah, she did get it sent to um, Governor Polis and he signed it into law um, Juneteenth of 2020. So, but yes, I was a part of the initial drafting. It wasn't just myself, it was also my community organizing organization, Frontline Party for Revolutionary Action, which is what we coined to just do a lot of justice work for Elijah McClain and Breonna Taylor and George Floyd. But we did do the initial drafting. Um, I hosted a big press conference about it. it it's, it's pretty public that I was one of the initial drafters of it. And I really do thank Ms. Hurrah for getting it passed into law because without her, I just wanted it to be on the ballot. But she actually got it to Governor Polis and got it passed into law. So she can claim that, but so can I.
That's all, both of our work. Terrence Roberts, thank you for your time. I appreciate Thanks it for very much. Me. I appreciate it.